Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast presented to you in conjunction with propertyofzack.com. And uh, if you have not visited that website or are aware of its existence, now you are, and go to it. Uh, it's a great site that uh, curates news and in independent music from tours to album releases to bands breaking up and everything else that you need to know. And the reason I like the site so much is because there is some editorial content on there that uh, you know gives it a personality, and it's run by one dude. And uh, I'm a big fan of people taking an idea and running with it, and that's exactly what Zach has done. So visit propertyofzach.com for some cool shit. Um, a few more orders of business before we delve into the guest for this week. Um, <clears throat> and for those of you who are new listeners, because I've been noticing there's been a lot more people checking out the show since our partnership with Property of Zach, and I don't know, maybe just friends telling friends or whatever. Subscribe to the show. I promise you that even though you may have no idea who this guest is or who the band is or whatever, I promise you that the conversations will elicit some either good stories, good information, something along those lines, um, because ultimately that's what I'm trying to capture, not so much the idea of, oh, I can only care about this interview if I am a super fan about this band or, you know, this medium or whatever. Um, the idea is that I want to showcase why people do what they do. And I think that's a universal truth that a lot of people are interested in and hearing other people tell their stories about why they do what they do. Um, so yeah. Subscribe. Go to iTunes and subscribe or go to Stitcher Radio. You can find that on the Stitcher Radio app um, or whatever other medium you like to listen to podcasts. Or even if you don't subscribe, go visit 100wordspodcast.com and you can listen to the shows if you don't want to download them or you can just simply download an MP3 um, if you hate iTunes. So yeah, do all that. Because I don't want you missing this content. I think uh, if you like one show, you'll probably like the next one and the next one. And that's the idea. Anyways. Um, so if you do check this out and you do enjoy it, review the show on iTunes. Uh, that's the best place to do it. Three seconds will take you to press three stars, four stars, five stars. That's you know, once you actually find the podcast on iTunes. Um, you, there's two options. Like I said, you can give it a star review, which will take two seconds out of your day. Um, or if you wanted to take two minutes out of your day and write a nice review, I read them and I really do appreciate them. And it's cool to hear people's feedback and kind of where they got introduced to the show and all that other fun stuff. Um, also I wanted to comment on someone who made fun of me on Twitter and I appreciate that. And it wasn't so much making fun of, but just the fact that Sometimes, I think everybody suffers from this, when you get a certain turn of phrase in your head and it just is easy to insert anywhere you possibly want. Uh, that's what it was like a few weeks ago for me when I can't even remember what show, but I said some way, shape, or form. And uh, I might have said it a lot. And so someone joked around and said, hey, we should create a drinking game based around this. And anytime Ray says that, we should take a shot. Um, I can't stop you. You can easily do that. But I apologize if I do say the same shit over and over. But, you know, I'm human. And I like certain phrases just because they're easy transition points. So, uh, yeah, fucking deal with it, right? <laughs> Anyways, the guest this week is Jordan Billy from the Blood Brothers. Um, and some of you uh, younger folk may have no idea who the Blood Brothers are. Um, or you're maybe paying attention and obviously doing your research and finding out about bands that existed prior to the whole boom of the internet era, uh, even though they were around when that was happening. But I digress. So Jordan Billy is one of the vocalists of the band, and because they had two vocalists, and uh, they were from Seattle, and um, I really, really like this band. And it just, through random coincidences... 
uh, myself and Jordan ended up working at the same place. And uh, I remember going into um, the office that I work out of one day and seeing him do like his working interview. And I sat down across from him and I was like, dude, this guy looks so fucking familiar. I can't place it. And then, you know, a day or two later, uh, one of my other coworkers was like, hey, did you know that was Jordan from the Blood Brothers? And I was like, holy shit, that's incredible. Um, Because I had seen them so many times throughout the years because they had come through Southern California a lot. But um, they had a really amazing story and just kind of watching that band develop. Um, So I was really excited to sit down with Jordan. And I was also nervous as well because... Um, you know, sometimes after a band breaks up and, um, you know, decides to move on with their lives, uh, they might not want to, you know, dredge up old stuff or talk about the past, um, or they might be very selective, but Jordan was not the case. Jordan was extremely open and, um, you know, very candid about the way that the band operated and how they kind of navigated the crazy waters that they were a part of. So, um, Anyways, I will stop blabbering because I'm just really excited about this interview. So here is some conversation that I had with Jordan. And one little note, uh, we were having lunch together. um, And so you will hear some crinkles or some chew sounds. And, you know, I apologize for that. But this was the best form for us to meet in. And um, yeah, so you'll hear some of that. So you know, just act like you're sitting next to us and having lunch and hearing some potato chips being, you know, moved around or whatever. So, anyways, here's the interview with Jordan, and I hope you enjoy. This is Old Black. When that came out, it was one of those things where, I mean, I had fought, like when Second Nature was releasing a record, uh-huh. I was, I, I will, I am all in. I am buying it immediately. I literally bought every release of theirs just because it was like I trusted that label, mm-hmm. and so bought that record and was already aware of you guys just because, um, obviously being on the West Coast, like you know, you yeah. had come down here before, mm-hmm. um, but it it was such a. Uh, I don't know. It was so unique where it was like, cause you know, I mean, I was by all definition of the term, a hardcore kid and, mm-hmm. you know, was into music that obviously didn't sound like that. But this, I felt like I was pushing my boundaries, so to speak, where I was like, oh, like I get this because like it's aggressive, but it's not aggressive in the, you know, chugga chugga mosh way that sure. <laughs> I'm sure you are intimately familiar with. Uh-huh. Um, and so like, as, as this stuff was all happening and then obviously once, you know, the, the sort of train started to leave the station and mm-hmm. watching everything kind of explode around, um, you guys, it was just like such a, such a weird experience. And I'm sure that, I mean, obviously when you guys started the van, I presume it wasn't like, all right, here's our business plan. Like <laughs> here, here's what we're doing. We're going to get signed. We're going to be this huge band. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that never, whereas like, I think today bands, maybe do start like that where it's like they have this idea. I, I think so too yeah I, I think I think that um I think the kids have gotten a lot more savvy mm-hmm. these days now. yeah they know they know what to or they know what to do to make them quote-unquote successful mm-hmm. like we need a booking agent well, we and, need and the information is out there right you know and, and I think that uh when when we started our band we were sophomores juniors in high school right and this was this was pre-internet or very right. early days of internet <laughs> right and like, yeah geocity <laughs> websites yeah, right yeah yeah um, <laughs> which yeah so, it's, it's so funny to even think of it right <laughs> totally chat rooms where you'd be like trying to book shows <laughs> yeah. um and so 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 yeah, we did we did that first record, and I, I I haven't listened to that first one in ages. But yeah, to me it was more of a confluence of all of our individual uh, influences than yeah. anything else. I and I think that that's kind of what you do when you start your first band. When totally, you're, when you're in high school, junior high, or whatever it may be, you look toward what inspires you, and you try to make something similar at least that's what our approach was so it, de- it definitely did 
sound like you guys obviously put a lot of stuff in the blender or you're uh-huh. just like yeah you know, like and which is cool because obviously a lot of bands are like you know i mean i remember the first bands that i played in where i was like all right i would love to sound like you know Snapcase meets unbroken mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then it's like obviously then you sound nothing like that because yeah. you can't write yeah. that music or whatever yeah but you guys definitely seemed like you had obviously way more of a palette that you were choosing from so to speak <laughs> we were i mean there was there's a lot we were very fortunate because there's a lot of just ridiculously great stuff coming out of the northwest during that time right and and there is also a very supportive and um just fertile all ages scene right uh i could i could go to shows uh at a venue called the old firehouse that was a teen center sure it was in a town right next to where you know, my parents lived in... Because that, so that, that was in Bellevue? Or it was, was in Redmond. Redmond, that's right. And I grew up in Kirkland. Right, okay. And it was, you know, it was no big deal for them to drop me off at a teen center on a Friday night right. where, you know, there's adult volunteers. Right. You know, there's... They felt like you were in you were in okay hands there. Exactly, right, exactly. Right. And so, so, you know, at a very young age, I think... You know, the first show I went to was at the old firehouse. I was probably 12 or 13. That's incredible. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was able to see things like, you know, Jawbreaker, Unwound, Blonde Redhead. It's amazing. Rocket from the Crypt, Quicksand. I remember mm-hmm. Quicksand yeah. played there. Um, and then later on, stuff like Botch, Murders of the Devils. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah. The, this great band from Olympia behind the prophet no lord shall live yeah 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 um, and uh, so you were but just because it was like at this place where obviously you were able to have access to so much different music yeah in a in a what your parents defined as a safe environment exactly. it was like you yeah you kind of had the 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 different musical spectrums at your fingertips yeah and um and so that venue is where i'm you know Johnny and myself and our first guitar player, Devin, met our future bandmates. It's where we played our first show. Um, Ground Zero. I'm sure, and I'm sure a lot of people from that music scene, that was like Ground Zero for a lot of them. Like a lot of bands that kind of spawned off and started playing together. And and, and coincidentally, there was was another teen center in Bellevue uh, Mm -hmm. called Ground Zero. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That we we would play as well, but but for... um, we were uh, we were a lot more involved uh, at the old firehouse because sure. how they did it was amazing. They would they would set aside one uh, night a month okay. for brand new bands to play. Oh, and nice! In the way that you got uh, on one of those shows is you came to what was called a band pool meeting, and you oh, brought wow. your demo. We listened to every demo, wow. and then we voted on who got to play the next month's show, and that's that's how the Blood Brothers got our first show. That's incredible. Um, I've never I've never heard of that sort of democratic de- democratic process for because I mean usually you hear, I mean I fell victim to it when I started playing shows in mm-hmm. the Southern California area, like the whole pay to play, where it's just like, yeah, oh yeah. dude, f- you sell fifty tickets, yeah. and it was like, you know, you do that once or twice, and you'd be like, holy shit, hold yeah. on, this, this is absurd, a, this is absurd. terrible, like. Because usually you wouldn't end up selling all the tickets, and then you would have to be like, "Hey, mom, can I borrow four hundred bucks?" Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or you know, playing at a bar where you stand outside and you mm-hmm. wait, and then you play, and then you leave. Right. Or just living in a town that had nothing. Nothing going at all. on. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. So, were you were you uh, born and raised in the Pacific Northwest? Yes. Nice. Yes. In Kirkland. Uh, first in a very small town called Kenmore. Okay. Uh, and then. I was getting into a little bit of trouble in, oh, no. in, uh, in uh, elementary school, and, and my parents uh, decided that me and my, my twin sister should uh, go to school in Kirkland. Interesting. So yeah. the, you were, um, was there any specific reason that you were getting in trouble besides maybe boredom or rebellion boredom. at an early age? Just absolute, you know, the boredom that comes from living in a tiny suburb. <laughs> Right, you so know. like juvenile type stuff, like breaking windows and nothing even that hardcore. I mean, just like <laughs> you know, smoking cigarettes or sure, um, getting detention or getting in trouble at recess. Right, right. Those, 
You're like, this, this, this kid Jordan's a ruffian. Yeah. Like, he's, he is a bad influence yeah, on all these other little exactly. kids. Exactly, we've got to nip this in the bud. <laughs> right, yeah, we gotta, we have to say, so did you and your sister, were you guys kind of like uh, pals and obviously like discovering the world together? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. We, we, we still are. We're, we're twins. And right. We're, we're extremely close. We played in our first band together. Uh-huh. This is prior to the Blood Brothers. Um, she plays... She plays drums. She plays drums in a band called The Gossip. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah, she's always on tour. Um, right. Love watching her play. She's absolutely incredible drummer. That's awesome. So you guys, I mean, from what I've heard from other people who are twins, it's like you definitely see a very uh, distinct either movement closer to one another mm-hmm. or a distinct, I have to be completely separate from them. And that's yes. cool that you guys obviously came was together. The former of the two, yeah. right? Right. That you were like, oh yeah, this is this is something that is fun, and we want to be a mm-hmm. part of this. Um, we would, we you know, we shared clothes. You know, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> and band t-shirts. Sure, of course. Everything, you know? Yeah. Um, so did your uh, what your parents do? Like in the... they were teachers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like in uh, high school or elementary school. Um, or... My mom is a elementary school music teacher okay and my dad taught uh, at the junior high that we went to oh that must have been tough yeah did you uh get picked on because your dad was at the school i got picked on but that wasn't um (laughs) that wasn't one of the reasons that wasn't one of the reasons no i I don't think so i mean I, i i got picked on more because you know me and my friends were sort of in this subclass of loser that everyone could pick on (laughs) you You were you were you were you were below like you were below the safe line of like oh yeah these like this group of kids is easy to pick on like they're they're the lowest hanging fruit so to speak yeah (laughs) i mean we couldn't even skate because like the um it, it you know, where we grew up, mm-hmm. skate culture and traditional high school bro culture were one and the same. So we didn't even have that as a refuge. Whereas right. so many of my friends and, and my wife, you know, they, you know. That was the place they could escape That's, that's the yeah, place yeah. where they could escape. They all skated and, you know, they they embraced that culture, mm-hmm. all the music, all the fashion, all the art that goes along with it. Right. But, for me, you're like, and, I can't go anywhere. Yeah, I, can't even, I couldn't even do that, you know? So when, when did you start to feel the divide? Like, uh, this is as you were going to... Um, this was in junior high. In junior yeah. high. Was that kind of the first point that, or the first part where you started to realize, like, I'm getting I'm getting picked on for being me and this sucks? Like, uh-huh. yeah. yeah. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Junior, junior high is, is brutal. Yeah. I, I wouldn't wish that experience on anyone. Yeah. You know, it is... Uh, it's unreal. Yeah. Um, no, I, I mean, people definitely, like, I I distinctly remember that was the first time where I started to realize, like, was, I think, yeah, it was in seventh grade, where it's like, you know, it's taking off my shirt, and it's like, I've never been, you know, you are a very slender fellow. I, I, I've i always carried around, you know, sure. a little stomach or whatever mm-hmm. the case may mm-hmm. be, but I've never viewed myself as like, you know, oh, I'm fat or whatever. Sure. That just didn't enter my mind. Yeah. But thankfully, Max, an eighth grader, mm-hmm. was just like, you know... Oh, look at that fatty! And I was yeah. just like, I was like, you were lucky to have someone to remind you. Of yeah, that. I'm like, or, oh, or, or, oh, yeah, or point that out for the first time. Totally, yeah. and it's, I yeah, and it was like it, it really, I mean, like I, because I remember his name, and I'm sure that there are people's names where you're just like, yeah, that person was oh, yeah. absolutely terrible to yeah. me, and it's like, yeah, junior high definitely it 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 is when the uh, the outside world starts to come down on you, and you're like, mm-hmm. oh wow, like maybe I'm you know me being comfortable with myself, like. You start to question that. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, and so, as you were uh, trying to find refuge, like is that is that kind of why your sister and you bonded so closely when you guys were kind of advancing through elementary and junior high? Where we, yeah, I mean, we were we've always been very close, but that mm-hmm. you know having, um, you know, I I, I think any time that you're that you're that you feel like you're sort of like the rank outsider, mm-hmm. um, you're going to become closer with the people that feel the same way. Mm-hmm. For me, it was it was my sister, it was Johnny, mm-hmm. it was, you know, my friends Tyler and Ryan, who also had a band. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was, it was my friend Devin. And these are all people that, um, for the most part, I'm... You're I'm still, still right, with. right. Yeah. And it's so yeah. funny because then you would probably look at the people that gave you the most shit 
and they probably they probably don't keep in contact with anybody no. from that perspective and probably have a very narrow view on how the world is like you know compared to you where it's just to be like oh like i've been able to you know experience the world and you know they maybe have never been outside of whatever their given town may be yeah i mean and you can it was it was easy to sort of discern those people when you <laughs> when you were in high school where you can tell like this this is going to be the high point for them yeah, you know, they, this they ends put, right here. They've, they've put all their eggs in this basket. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I would just kind of laugh to myself. Right. You know, and you'd be like, "This is this is going to end for me, and I'm going to be able to do what yeah, I define is, as fun." This like, is this is six years of of my life that I have to kind of put my head down and, and get through. Get through. But yeah. then I have everything after that right right and so as you were uh when did independent music kind of become i mean i know you were mentioning obviously the venue did Mm -hmm. was that kind of when it started to really uh get introduced to you yes yeah because i would it it gave me the opportunity to see things Mm -hmm. um that that i wouldn't see um by turning on my television or my radio right right Uh, and since i could always since I could always go to the old firehouse, it was it was my my place of refuge. Yeah, you know, me and my friends would just go every weekend. Right. You know, every any time there was a show, it didn't yeah, it didn't matter, matter who it was. Who was. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was dirt cheap. It, you know, it was five dollars or less. Right. And so I just sucked everything in. That's incredible. You know? Yeah. And um, after. After going to shows there for a few years, mm-hmm. you know, like I said, we played our first show, mm-hmm. started to go, you know, started to, you know, follow the bands that we liked. Right. Um, and then started to play with the bands that we liked sure. and started to branch out to other venues. Uh, there was there was a great venue in Seattle and Pioneer Square called the Velvet Elvis. Mm-hmm. And they would also do all ages shows. But the great thing about that venue was that their all ages shows a lot of the times were Sunday matinees. Oh, okay. And Pioneer Square, the neighborhood where it was located, is pretty dicey. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, but again, my parents had no problem dropping us off somewhere at two p.m. Yeah. In the afternoon. What trouble can possibly go? Yeah. We would we would be dropped off for a show and be out of there by six. Right. You know, and and so. I, I would see tons of bands come through the Velvet Elvis. A, a lot of bands that maybe wouldn't make it out to uh, Redmond because they maybe didn't the want suburbs or whatever. Yeah, they yeah, didn't yeah. want to route like a weird suburban city of into course. a tour. Sure. Um, and, and that's where I saw you know just tons of more weirdo stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, more national bands. Sure, sure. Um, and. It was really, it was really having the experience of of playing shows mm-hmm. with with my peers, and then also people that I looked up to right. that that initially, you know, blew my mind. Right, and it, I mean, mind. I'm sure it just blew my world wide open. Right, and I'm sure it was one of those things, like you said, it was your refu- it was your refuge, and you started to feel like that sense of community. Where it's yeah. like, I mean, as cliched as it sounds, where it's like, you know, the all, all the weirdos show up at the same room, mm-hmm. and then you're just like, "Oh, okay, you may be a different weirdo, mm-hmm. like, but we're still in the same boat because yeah. we're still experiencing, you know, this awesome band live or whatever." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, when did it, did you always have that desire to be like, "I have to play in a band"? Yeah, like, yeah. Once you kind of saw it, it was it was once I heard um, like Nirvana. Yeah, you know, it was that. That was you know when I was about eleven or twelve, mm-hmm. uh, and then going to a new junior high. Um, you know, the first, the first kids that I met, um, Tyler and Ryan Mm -hmm. and Tyler's older brother, Adam, they had a band and it was the first time that I saw people my age playing instruments and practicing in their garage and, and actually doing it. Right. And, and, uh, that's revelatory. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would just go over their, uh, their house after school every day and just hang out and watch them practice. Yeah, which is you know? just like the best thing that you could possibly do at the time. It's Definitely. Like, oh, it's incredible. Definitely. Mm. And then and then my sister and and Johnny mm. and my good friend Devin, who ended up uh, being the first guitar player in the Blood Brothers, mm. they played in a band together. And okay. then, you know, it was all sort of the same pool of kids in the same social circles. Right. So 
you know, things kind of shifted around. Um, I started playing with uh, Hannah and Johnny and Devin, mm-hmm. and then Hannah started to play with another group of like-minded girls. Sure. And then me and Johnny and Devin uh, met Cody and Mark um, mm-hmm. at at a show. Sure. And, you know, we started with Figured brothers. You, right, yeah. right. So what, what what was the what was the official first band that you played with that you actually started to you know play shows with that or okay that uh, that band was called Vade uh, okay terrible band name that's like uh, well, that's not that bad there it's are, pretty bad though <laughs> there are worse but there yeah. are worse but right it's, right it's, it's still pretty embarrassing I, would I, it... I would also contend that the Blood Brothers is a pretty bad band name. <laughs> Um, but but again, both both things that you know we came up with when we were fifteen, sixteen. <laughs> right, of course. And you're like this is this is the much. right. You're yeah. like this is the way that it's going to exist in perpetuity forever. <laughs> exactly. You can't really plan on that. <laughs> what did what did that uh, what did that uh, first incarnation sound like? It was weird. It sounded like um, you know the stuff that we really loved was like Unwound, mm-hmm. um, a band called Bare Minimum. Okay. Uh, read like Jehu. Sure, sure. Um, just, just yeah. weirdo stuff. It was. It wasn't as. It wasn't as punk as mm. the Blood Brothers. It was more sort of that early, you know, early to mid '90s like emo y stuff. Right, and right, was, right. I mean, we were about fifteen. Right, like right, 95, right. '96. Sure, sure. And so, and you were singing in that band? No, no, I was okay. playing bass. Okay. Johnny was singing. Okay. Hannah was playing drums. Okay. And Devin was playing guitar, and then Mark. Um, Blood Brothers drummer was playing guitar. Sure. Yeah. And so once you started to kind of get into this world and obviously like playing in bands and everything, um, it's kind of a two part question. Mm-hmm. One, I presume your high school, like, did you did you take it seriously as far as like your studies were concerned? And mm-hmm. were you okay? Did you got good grades? Oh, good. Yeah. Nice. Like, because uh, you usually you find kids like once they find music, they're just like, fuck that. I'll get C's. I'll just ride yeah, through. I whatever. Was, I was serious about it. That's uh, cool. Because I. Uh, I hated where I lived, and and I figured that I wanted to give myself every opportunity I could to okay. do whatever I wanted. Right, right. That's a yeah. That's a very uh, that's a very mature decision. Because yeah, because you, you, <laughs> like whether or not in <laughs> retrospect, you know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, okay. So you took your you took your studies seriously, mm-hmm. and because of that, do you think your parents like you know did were they reacting negatively to I mean it sounds like they were supportive to a certain extent of you mm-hmm. doing bands and like dropping yeah. off at shows and stuff. Yeah. And so as long as you were kind of like keeping up your studies they exactly. were Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. As as long as you know I was getting my homework done and stuff. Right. And, I mean they they were they were very supportive. They they told us that we could do whatever we wanted, you know, music wise. That's cool. They'd buy us instruments if we agreed to take lessons. Oh, um, okay. You know, my mom was a music teacher, right? So it, it, you have that built-in understanding yeah, where she's like, "Okay, yeah. I, like this isn't some you know completely foreign territory for her." Totally. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so then, as you, uh, yeah, as you started to progress through high school, and then um, you know, obviously, like the the Blood Brothers started to uh, take over your life. Mm-hmm. Um, did you go to college at all? I went for two years. Okay. Yeah, I went to the University of Washington. Okay. What were you studying there? Just doing undergraduate stuff. That's true. First two years. I, yeah, right? I hadn't figured it out yet. Right, right, right. Yeah. And were you were you doing that to kind of like bide your time as the band was kind of going, or did you do that because you're like, no, I really wanted to get a degree. I really wanted to get a degree, Got it. and this was this was still at the you know, at a time where we really, other than playing shows, putting out records, and touring, we didn't we didn't have any aspirations beyond the immediate right you know what beyond I'm yeah no beyond that that it, i'm really glad you brought that up because that was that's definitely very um symptomatic of that era where you just like you know it, it would be you'd be just putting one foot in front of the other mm-hmm. you'd be like all right we'll release a demo like mm-hmm. here let's do this next thing like okay cool let's book our first you know west coast tour exactly. or whatever and exactly. so yeah you didn't and have these... you book your first west coast tour and then you try to put together a U.S. tour, right? And and we were doing all this stuff ourselves, and sure, um, making phone calls, right. emailing people, right? Yeah. What role did, did you uh, play in the band in regards to like you know? Did you handle a lot of the business, or yeah. were you? Yeah, you were the Johnny and I did. Yeah. yeah. As far as it's kind of funny how that always falls on singers. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know why. Like you could be the most <laughs> like disorganized person, but just because you're 
you have a microphone and you're in sure. the front of the stage, people mm-hmm. are like, oh, we'll talk to you first uh-huh. or we'll exactly. settle with you for the... Exactly. <laughs> and there, there's other... I mean, there, you know, um, there's other people in the right. band that are probably <laughs> more interesting to right. talk to or more, or more, more ideas, right. and more things to express as far as, you know, how the music was created and you know, right. things like that. <laughs> they're like, but they, they kept going to me for business yeah. stuff. Um, and so as you were, um, so a- after you were doing like those first two years of college and then, mm-hmm. then obviously you, uh, you dropped out because, but that's when things started to kind of exactly really get real. Yeah. Um, what did, and again, kind of, you know, were your parents like, as they were watching the journey, like, you know, you were, I'm sure keeping them up to date and being like, this is there's crazy stuff that's happening mm-hmm. here with us. Like, were they pretty excited for you? Or were they pretty scared of the fact that you were dropping out? My, um, you know, my mom mm-hmm. was, was, was pretty concerned. She, she did not like the idea of me dropping out of school to do my punk band. Sure. But <laughs> which, what, which is within reason. <laughs> sure. But, um, what, what I told her at the time, uh, and, and I, I still think this is, uh, entirely entirely valid i still stand by it Mm -hmm. is that school will always be there totally and the opportunity to you know make records with your best friends and right travel Mm -hmm. and see the world and and do something that you love that's that's not something that's always going to be there for you no that could it's very yeah it's i mean it's fleeting like not every yeah. not everybody gets to experience that. and if you don't and, and if you don't at least take a stab at uh seeing what that's like um you know i i i, I shudder to think of living an entire life of regret not having experienced the things that i was fortunate enough to experience with that band totally totally yeah, yeah if you like if you didn't see that through you could be you know sitting wherever you're i mean probably in a very different position where you are mm-hmm. now mm-hmm. and be like, God, I wish I would have done that. But, you know, instead I opted to get my, you know, spend an additional two years and get a degree and, mm-hmm. you know, which, I mean, that in and of itself isn't a hollow pursuit, but it's a completely entirely, like you said, it's always going to be there. True. Um, and so <clears throat> obviously with everything happening with the Blood Brothers and it became, I mean, honestly, it, from this is completely from the outsider's perspective as I was watching this all transpire because you know by this time you guys had you know come through Southern California a decent amount and you had done you know all the shows that you played at you know Coos and PCH Club like you know it really you really felt a groundswell of support it's like Mm -hmm. oh wow like you know they more kids come out each time yeah um but then just hearing the way that um I mean especially because it was like you know at the drive-in, and then shortly after, Blood Brothers. It was like those, you know, you guys were definitely the bands where it was like, from our independent community, like, obviously, since the whole Nirvana explosion, where sure. it was just like the bands that had kind of bubbled up, where it's like, you know, you've, you've, been, given, you've been given the torch to be proverbially passed. <laughs> and so it's like, I'm sure during that time, was it like the most stressful yet... Like, I mean, where was your mind at during those times where it was just like, holy shit, this is crazy? Or like, this is just like, you kind of yeah, took it in stride? Like, it, a combination of, of, of all those <laughs> of things. Of every emotion, you know, yeah. It was, it was wild. I mean, we, we were contacted by, by Ross to record our record mm-hmm. shortly after This Adultery is Right. Mm-hmm. We hadn't, we had, we had written a lot of March on March Electric on Children, Children, but right. we hadn't recorded it yet. Okay. And we'd already, you know, we'd already agreed to put that record out with 3-1-G. Right. We'd already agreed to have Matt Bayless record it. Sure. And, and so we told uh, Ross, you know, we, we have plans for our next record already, but right. we can do the let's next keep, right, let's keep know, touch, right, right. the next one. And, um, and so... We sort of we kept in touch with him. He had us come down, meet with him, mm-hmm. meet with labels and stuff. In in he was know, so he was kind of shepherding you guys exactly, through. Exactly, okay. exactly. He was he was in a position from the records that he did that he'd done prior, right? Where he could pick a band, and any number of labels would say yes. I'm already interested. We're we're already interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
and he happened to pick us. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is like did, when he initially reached out to you. Like, you know, was it difficult for you guys to reconcile? Like, it's not difficult for you guys to reconcile, you know, the fact that he can, you know, kind of pick good music, so to speak. Like, you're like, okay, I understand that. But you're like, I'm sure, like, you're... We didn't even understand that. I mean, I, we didn't... <laughs> you're like, why us? We didn't, under, we didn't understand, you know, what a producer did. <laughs> right. Seriously. Totally. We, we, were, like, we were like, well, we record our music. You know, the, the engineer records it. <laughs> right. Where do, you, where, where do you fit into the right. equation? Right. How, yeah, how's this happening? You know, and... um. <laughs> You know, we, and, and I, I mean, and how to put this delicately, I, I guess we weren't, we weren't into at all, like, the stuff that he'd recorded. No, no, yeah. You know? Which is, I mean, because it, it's, they're two separate worlds. Yeah, and, and, and so it was, it took a lot of kind of back and forth and, and, I'm sure. and, and talking to him, getting an idea of what he was looking to do talking amongst ourselves sure know, he was very clear that you know i i just like what you do and i want to help you capture it to the to the best right you know, of your ability of your ability yeah yeah and um that's that's yeah. what yeah and i'm sure yeah because that, that to me that was always like i remember because like you know late 90s i mean you know managers existed within mm -hmm. independent mm -hmm. culture but it was still a very new thing for like bands you know bands that i'm friends with or whatever like you know when my band was existing mm -hmm. like getting picked up by management like you know like being from orange county bands i remember the first band like that band atreyu mm -hmm. where it was like they got picked up by management and i was like they've signed on to the devil like well, something just, i mean the the, yeah. the lines were drawn so much uh, more clearly totally back then where it's like it just felt like an awkward had, step yeah you had you had the underground and then you had yeah um the whole world of major labels and you know there one did not cross over into the yeah. other without incurring a certain amount of wrath right um ocean it, they were definitely oceans apart yeah like. and, and you know i would i would think the same thing i mean to mm -hmm. me like Having having a manager, having all these things, they just seemed corny. They just seemed stupid. <laughs> right, right, right. I do this, you know, myself, or I do this with the help of, you know, my friends who, right. who I trust. Um, Instead of this know, random dude coming out of nowhere and being like, oh, like, okay. Exactly, exactly. And, I mean, it, obviously it's completely different now. You know? Yeah. It's like Mountain Dew puts out records. <laughs> people, people, don't, don't. People, don't, people really don't care at all, you know? Can, yeah. you, imagine, can you imagine telling your friends that Mountain Dew is going to put out your record? Yeah, you in, could. In, you know. 98? Yeah, 98, 2000. You know, sure, it'd be like, like uh, <laughs> yeah, are, are, you, are you like a you know a radio rock band or something yeah, like yeah, yeah you've totally that those those worlds don't don't mix but i mean it's cool that you i always did admire and still do the fact that you guys were just like you know what like obviously like you said you talked internally you felt comfortable whether or not it was the, the you know in retrospect the best step you could have taken you're just like we have to try this mm -hmm. like we have to kind of you know really put ourselves out there yeah. Um, as long as we feel comfortable making these steps, and I'm sure yeah. there was many late nights. So, yeah, and so it was. It, it was a combination of just feeling completely in over our heads, but then also trying to take everything with a certain grain of salt. Sure. And and that's exactly how I thought of it. I, I you know, I, I told myself I'm I'm 19 years old. Right. I'm in college, and mm -hmm. I don't know what I want to do. Right. I'm working a job that, you know. It is just a job. Mm -hmm. It's 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 nothing that I'm passionate about. Right. I'm um, just killing time here. Ex exactly. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, this person and, and and this label has given us an opportunity to do something that we love to do and that we'd be doing anyways. Right. And we just kind of figured uh, we'd be foolish not to at least try. Right. And, right. Right. Yeah. And that's that. That's what I always thought. Like especially just because it's like after you know Burn Piano Island. Like once, <clears throat> once that did come out, and obviously was received well, not only you know like from the mainstream critical world, but then like you know the a lot of your fans that obviously didn't have this myopic view of like oh I can't enjoy them now, mm -hmm. um, whether or not like it, it, maybe it was like I can't enjoy them now because I hate them musically, mm -hmm. but like the whole you know like you said the whole dividing line where it's yeah. just like oh they're a major I can't like them. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you were kind of experiencing this and like looking back on it. Um, what, cause I'm sure you were put into 
many situations where you were like, this is the weirdest fucking thing that I have done. Mm-hmm. Like whether it was like a press opportunity, like oh, yeah. what, what one or two things like stuck out in your mind where it was like, Oh my God, like this is weird. Like why do, why are we doing this? Oh yeah. I mean, there, there, was, there was, I mean, there, there were moments where, <laughs> you know, the, the five of us were sitting in a big conference room around like a huge conference <laughs> table with, with the label that we would eventually sign with. Right. And, just the way that they were the way that they were describing to each other what it was that we did and how we operated it operated was just absolutely bizarre you know to to see a label head telling their i don't even know what yeah like middle management or whatever yeah whatever you know (laughs) these guys what they do is they will play a house and then they'll stay at that house that they play at, and, and this was like blowing their minds, and, and we were see- we just felt like we felt like like a weird like sideshow curiosity. You know? <laughs> right. just sitting there, and we're like, yeah, right, that's, that's what we do, right? You know? and, and they'd be like, "Well, we need to get you on a real tour," and and for for them to say that to someone who had who had helped book all of you know our tours, we were you know we were just sort of like, well, I don't. I don't want to go on tour with the Deftones. <laughs> right, right, you know, right. Or, well, how is this going to benefit like whatever, us? Whatever right. Whatever else, you know, they're, they're talking about. You right, know, right. Things that they're just sort of pulling out, you know, and... and <laughs> how would I make this dream come true for you? Yeah, you know, and we're just like, eh, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, dude, I'm sure... I'm sure there were so many opportunities or so many times where, the, you know, the guys sitting on the end of the table were just like, Look at these fucking guys. Like they don't realize the opportunities they have when they're saying so. no. I mean, or I think that I think that they you know, they trusted you know, like like any like a lot of labels and, mm-hmm. and I've tr- you know the labels that he was working with, they they trusted Ross as you know, kind of like a tastemaker. Yeah, a purveyor you know? of fine bands, and, right? Yeah, and I think when he brought us, mm-hmm. they're like, you know, well, if if you say so, <laughs> you know right, right, We're, yeah, and, totally. And and to to everyone that we worked with, credit, you know, what we what we recorded and what we handed in, that was what they put out, and they which is great. They yeah. didn't come to the studio. I think they came to the studio once, right, just to listen to some stuff, and they're like, yeah, this is this is good. Right, um, and and then left. It was really um, yeah, because you obviously hear the horror stories. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. weren't intrusive at all. There wasn't an A and R person. I mean, Ross, Ross was, was pretty much acting as our A and R person, and he was very protective over what it was we wanted to do. That's great. Um, and you know, like I, yeah, like I said, exactly what we recorded was exactly what they put out. Right. And um, well, it's incredible that you got. <clears throat> I mean, that's that's an ideal opportunity to be in, because, and that's I'm sure where because you guys felt comfortable. It's like once you trusted Ross, and you're mm-hmm, like, yo, mm-hmm. we can let you in on our world then everything else that you would do would be awkward because it's something like you said that you're sitting in boardrooms and have no idea what you know mm-hmm. they don't know your world but you'd be like well you know we have this shield between us mm-hmm. like you know ross is going to be able to like you know we trust him and we know that we're not going to be thrown into the bus exactly you know, all yeah. these other horror stories yeah um and so you know part part of the charm or at least the charm that i always enjoyed of blood brothers was you know once you guys started to do you know quote unquote step out on more you know adventures and tours where it's like you know you're not playing to people that have any context for who you are sure um you know like i mean i remember our our first discussion where we were talking about you know the tour that you guys did with glass job uh-huh. and it was like i remember seeing you at the glass house in pomona and just like people just you know fucking faggots like just oh, yeah, I hated it. and like did and from what I saw and I experienced was it's like you know once you once you guys kind of started to get a negative reaction from people, um, you kind of just gave it that much more. You're just like, well, that's who we are. Like, yeah. fuck you. Like, you know, was that by that? Time, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't conscious. Like, you guys were like, you know, sitting backstage being like, this is what's going to happen on this mm-hmm. tour or whatever. But I mean, it might have been like it might have been something you guys were like, okay, we're probably going to go over pretty poorly on this tour. But the kids that do like us or the you know we will appeal to this sure. section of the crowd i mean that was that was our first experience with anything like that and mm-hmm. we 
we honestly didn't know what to expect. Right. We just knew that, you know, we were we were supporting this band who who again, you know, they had they had recorded with, with Ross as well. There mm-hmm. was a connection there. And, sure. You know, they asked us to do that tour with them. And it was with American Nightmare. Yes. Um and yeah, I mean I mean the the crowds were you know, a lot of the shows just you know, openly hostile. Uh-huh. Not every show, but, right? But when they were, you know, it, it was pretty vicious. And I just, th- there wasn't any, you know, we never kind of sat down and discussed how we were going to approach that because right. there was nothing that we were expecting. Sure. Um, but I, I think it was just like you said, like our, our our mindset was, well, if you don't like us too bad you're stuck with us for right. a half hour yeah and we're not going anywhere right you know? we're gonna play like oh you don't, you're not into us we'll just go ahead and leave right now yeah yeah, yeah. i mean you, you <laughs> expect that to happen yeah. <laughs> like, totally totally um and i i think for me there's 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 no there's no point in trying to um do anything more to sway someone's opinion than than just playing i mean right we we were what we were that's what we did and and we accepted the fact that it's not for everyone yeah and and we would go on these tours the glass jaw one being one of them where mm-hmm. it clearly wasn't for everyone because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah that, i definitely you guys were a very uh black and white band it was yeah, like you i i and and i kind of you know i'm kind of proud of that the fact that you either loved us or hated us i, I think that there's a lot there's a lot of stuff out there where you just kind of shrug your shoulders and you're like, mm, yeah, it's okay, or it's not, you know, and, and that's that's as much as you think about, it. right? You know, you just you don't engage with it at all. It's just sort of like totally, it's okay. It kind of reminds me of this, but, right? You know, there's there's no yeah, I you and, and that's what I liked about that band was, you know, it, it was so it was so polarizing, mm-hmm. and and so the people that really got it and and, and um, liked those records, loved them, and, right. and and the shows when we would do headlining shows were were amazing, right? Uh, and and it felt like we were kind of creating this whole world sort of unto ourselves, mm-hmm. and uh, that that was super inspiring um, to just see kids getting into weird weird music, right? Um, but. But yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I think you, you you hit on a very important point and something that I always, I definitely agree with you. That's something to be proud of because it's like you do like and no slight against a lot of the bands that are you know around currently, but you know a lot of the bands that you know play your Coachellas and whatever. It's like you know they kind of fall. They do. They're very vanilla and like mm-hmm. not in a bad way. Just in like like you said, they're you know they're easy to listen to. Like mm-hmm. you know you can you can put them on when you're working or whatever. But like the, you don't really feel. Um, like it elicits that high level of engagement where you're just like, oh my God, I have to see this live because like, you know, I know it's going to be some, you know, amazing experience. Mm -hmm. And like, it does like when you do have a glut of artists fall into the sort of gray area, you know, it definitely, uh, it, it's not as exciting. Like you don't feel, yeah. Like I said, you did, or like you said, you don't feel, you need those freak scenes. Yeah. You just, you need, you need those people that, that. Or sort of on their own weird little island, right? You know? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And those that, that was the kind of stuff that I always kind of gravitated towards, right? You know, yeah. Um, you know, even going to hardcore shows, the you know the band that I remember most and that I loved most was Behead the Prophet, right? It, it, I mean, it was like a freak show, totally, you know, completely, yeah. And that's that's what you're just like, yeah, because it elicits a reaction, mm-hmm. whether you like it or not. You you know. Like, you know yeah. whether you like it yeah. or you don't like it. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. Like, you know, but so <clears throat> obviously, because you guys tour, you toured so much. Um, yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of people who have never toured don't understand that it sucks a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, it really, there are two separate worlds when you're in a band. It's like there's, there's life, which is essentially touring. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, you're in this kind of suspended state of animation mm-hmm. where it's like, the world goes on around you, yeah. but you're just traveling and doing all these yeah. things, and it's exciting. It's but like the, being in suspended time, though. Yeah, yeah. 
because everybody like you know when you come home and other people have like you know done you know moved on move quote unquote moved on in their lives and you're just kind of like oh yeah like you know I, I was in china I did whatever you know like mm-hmm. did these crazy exotic things and then it's like okay cool like that yeah. the, the people on the outside can say like oh that's cool um you know when when for you did it kind of like you know just wear on you where you were like if there was a specific experience or whether it was like just the overall <laughs> roughness of the schedule where it was like <laughs> when did it wear on <laughs> I mean, like, because once you started a tour, like, yeah. you enjoyed that experience, I'm yeah. sure. I loved it. And then, I like, touring. Right. But, but like you said, I mean, it was, you know, essentially for six years mm-hmm. uh, straight, we were on, we were on a cycle of tour. Yep. Write, record, tour. And, and we did, it was, um, you know, March on, then burn, then crimes, then our right. then our last one. I mean, it came, they came out in like very rapid succession. Sure, and we we were always touring in between every recording session. Right, and even when we were waiting for the record to come out, we would be on tour. Right, you know, because that's that's how we supported ourselves. We didn't support ourselves from record sales at all. Oh, of course like, not. At, I mean, I don't think who does. <laughs> you know? But right. and so so it was just all touring and I I personally um, I think I uh, adapted to that lifestyle relatively pretty, relatively easily. Yeah. You know, I I think that I enjoyed um, I enjoyed sort of, you know, the sense of total freedom in in adventure. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Um, you know, going to a different, uh, you know, going to a different city every night, of and, course, and being able to see the world with you know my my best friends. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, who wouldn't love that? Um, right. But like you said, I mean, it it does. You're you're basically you're basically fighting off being sick for two or three months straight, and totally. then when you're done, your body tells you that it didn't like what you did to it for those right. past few It months. rebels. Totally. Yeah, and then you completely crash out. And I think that, you know, I, I forget, like, how um, how exhausting <laughs> the, the whole process is and just <coughs> how... Um, how terrible my body would always feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Either, either sleep deprived, sure, or, or hungover, or a combination of the two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Being in a van for eight hours, and then right. you know, it's 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 all those things that it, it to me it always sounds. You know, anyone who hasn't experienced it mm-hmm. um, has every you know every right to be like, well, you sound like a fucking asshole complaining about it. But, right. But like you said, if you haven't. If you haven't done it, totally. Then they're like the people. It, people are like, "Oh, rock star problems, whatever." Yeah. And it's like that. That it, it's not because it's yeah. like that. It is, you know. Once you get to the point where you're touring so much, that yeah. obviously it becomes your job. Yeah. That you know, it's still a job. Yeah. Like you know, you, even though you're doing something awesome and you're having yeah, fun. Any, like, anyone who who tries to say that being in a band isn't there isn't hard work involved is, is yeah delusion right <laughs> i mean it's hard it's hard work just to keep the relationship of five people together totally that's hard work 100 percent. it's it's hard work to drive eight hours completely fried out yeah 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 <laughs> you're like i do not want to do this yeah. like yeah but you've got no choice yeah. because you've got another you know three and a half months of tour it's rewarding it's right. some of the most rewarding work that that i've ever done of but, course but it's hard work, nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. <clears throat> and so, obviously, as things started to come to an end with Blood Brothers, and then, um, you know, the... And the, this, granted, again, this is my opinion. Sure. Um, but from what, I mean, you know, the, the, the few months that I've known you and kind of just, you know, seeing how you operate, mm-hmm. in, you know, in, from a, a daily working environment, sure. you've transitioned pretty well into the quote-unquote real life. Because some, mm-hmm. you know, some people, like, once, once that comes to a halt... Um, you know, they, they just don't know what to do with themselves. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure there were moments where you're just like, oh, I don't know what to do. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you seem to have transitioned well. Like, you know, was, was that a huge weight on your shoulder as things started to kind of come to an end where you're just like, what the fuck am I going to do? Or was it? Yeah. Because, because like I said, all of our, you know, you know, the way that we supported ourselves was off of touring. Right. And then once that whole 
engine you know came to came to a halt <laughs> yeah you know i had a few months you know until you know, the money yeah, yeah. dried out and I, and i needed to figure something out right and i knew that i knew that i didn't want to work at a venue and i knew i didn't want to work at a bar right i, I didn't want to be and you never um, you never wanted to work in the music industry at all after experiencing it no no. <laughs> I mean, no, it's funny because some yeah. people that's what they transit. I mean, that's I what mean, I transitioned by, into, by, but I totally understand. By that time, you know, 2007 or so, it was sort of like, well, what music industry? That's true. What, yeah. What are you supposed to even <laughs> Bad do? timing, right, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. And um, I, I just knew that I didn't want to be talking about, you know, the band breaking up every night, oh, you know, yeah. working at a, at a club that's or, true. or something yeah, yeah. like that. And I, I didn't want to be. I just didn't really want to be in, in that whole world. Right. I, I wanted to be anonymous, basically. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, I had a friend, Julia, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, worked at a nonprofit called Treehouse. Right. Uh, and she she was leaving uh, her position, but she thought it would be perfect for me. Yeah. And um, that's where I landed. Sure. Uh, and, I, and I worked there for four years before. Yeah, before down, working here. Yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, and sort of, uh, sort of to, to wrap things up, <clears throat> the um, obviously like during during this time, like you, you know, you are a married man now, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you were maintaining because you you had met her throughout the duration of the band, correct? Like mm -hmm. you know, you, there was and that that relationship existed during. Yeah, yeah. Me and Zoe started dating when two thousand three. Okay. Yeah, and that is hard. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so what, because I mean, a lot of people don't understand, I mean, especially like, you know, uh, the, the, you know, from younger bands of like, you know, being able to like maintain relationships on the road and not even just like, you know, the, um, you know, significant other relationships, mm -hmm. but like, you know, just having friends that are at yeah. home, like, yeah. you know, what, <clears throat> what was the, what was the most difficult thing for you during, you know, to like maintain this relationship for a person that you clearly cared about mm -hmm. and obviously, you know. The, the story is a it's a good ending you yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. you are married so there's nothing negative with that but um i mean i was very fortunate in that i met i met zoe um through playing shows together and, and going to shows right and um she she was in a band that toured with the blood brothers a couple times um mm -hmm. and and then after uh, after she was done with her band she was tour managing right. and so she was traveling just as much as i was yeah and so um, we both knew exactly uh, what, what it was like, into, what, sure. you know, what we were doing, and but but it was uh, difficult. I remember at one point she was, you know, our, our tour schedules were just not lining up yeah. at all, and I think we saw each other for a total of a week over like a six month oh. uh, time time span. Right, right, right. And, and that one was that one was particularly brutal. I mean, that, that's just ridiculous. That's stupid. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we had already been together for a few years before then. Right. So and you're just so, like, we just need to last through this. Yeah. Rat. I mean, we just we we had a solid foundation, and we you know we just tried to communicate with each other as much as we could. I'm I'm pretty bad about calling people and and, <laughs> and keeping in touch when I'm on tour, just because. Um, I, I just feel exhausted the whole time, and I just don't want to talk on the phone. I either want to be sleeping or, or staring at, like, a wall, basically. Right. Basically. You're like, I don't need you know, sensory just, right. Yeah, I just don't want to. Decompress. Yeah, right. I just want to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, you know, she was very patient, very understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we didn't have to, we didn't deal with any any major issues like infidelity or anything like right, that. Right, right, right. Part of the equation. Yeah. Um, so it was just about main, like keep, yeah, yeah, keeping, yeah, keeping that on the path. Cause you knew where you both wanted to end up. We did. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we knew, we knew that we were committed to each other. We didn't, we didn't know necessarily that we were going to end up being married. Right. But it's interesting, you know, to sort of bring it back to how, how the band was operating early on, mm -hmm. early on. It was, you know, we were focused on just sort of the immediate. You yeah. Know, like, okay, like we're gonna finish this tour and then we'll see each other, you know, when it's over. Right. And then okay, like we know that um we have this month where I can come up to Vancouver and see you for a few weekends or you come down, but then we're back on the road and we, we just right. you know, it was all very practical and, 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 and 
Right. Like I said, they're just sort of... Yeah. Or I no, think it, you probably said it earlier, just sort of one foot in front of the other until... It's, yeah, no, it's very... It, it's funny that you mentioned that because it's like, I never really... Uh, I, I had the same experience as yeah. you where it was like the, my wife where... Because, I mean, I got married uh, when I was 24, going on 25, which is early. Like, if you'd have talked mm-hmm. to me when I was 22, sure. I would have been like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. But that that exact feeling of, like, one foot in front of the other, where it was like, it just made sense. Yeah. Like, you didn't yeah. feel awkward about it. It yeah. was like, you know, you don't feel weird when you are just making these incremental steps. Mm-hmm. And like you said, planning where it's like, okay, like, I know we have this to look forward mm-hmm. to. And it's like, it just kind of happens because you're not too concerned. You're, you know, you're trying your best to live in the moment. Yeah. And that's that's I that's important for bands, relationships, life. Yeah, <laughs> very I mean, very sage like advice I mean, in a way. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you, have, you have to be present. You know, I I I, I look back on you know uh, a lot of the time mm-hmm. that I spent in the Blood Brothers, and I wish that I had been more present. I wish that I wasn't mm-hmm. you know concerned about you know planning you know what's yeah, coming next. Concerned sure. about Oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not happy with how my day is going, or I'm tired, or I'm cranky, or yeah, you know, I don't like the band that I'm touring. With, <laughs> right, right, you know, right. I don't like my own band. You know, I, <laughs> I sure, that, sure. You know, I think that for the most part, I I feel that we were able to deal with sort of, you know, our trajectory of experiences and and yeah, kind of trials and tribulations with with a sense of humor, but right. If I were to kind of go back, I, I, I would have liked to be more in the moment, more present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's yeah, that's a very uh, good piece of information for mm-hmm. anybody to have, just yeah. to whatever they're experiencing currently. Yeah. To like, I have, I have no, I have no like, um, I have no like video footage or anything of us <laughs> recording any of our records. <laughs> like, yeah, you're like, it's, like, it's all in my brain. <laughs> yeah, you know, like those kinds of things, you know, where it's like looking back, it's like I wish that I, you know. You know, picked up a camera or something. Right, like, right, you know, right. Documented something. <laughs> yeah, you're like, well, at least I have these records. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I do appreciate you obviously wanting to do this and hang yeah, out, no and problem. I hope you uh, enjoyed it in some way, shape, or form. My pleasure. <laughs> for sure. And there you have it. I only said in some way, shape, or form once during that episode. Booyah! Anyways, thanks for joining us, and uh, tune in next Tuesday for another exciting interview. Uh, Actually, this will be something special, something to kind of commemorate the 25th episode. So, uh, yeah, get ready. Um, Yeah, visit propertyofzach.com and find out all the latest and greatest. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye.